I want to say welcome to everybody that's part of the GS fam and that may be new to our GS fam. Welcome. Uh, please stand with me, don your mask. Um, to keep in with social distancing, we are going to do air daps, air fives, and air hugs from in place. Um, welcome your brothers and sisters around you, and let's share in fellowship together today. All right, if you would allow me to usher our spirit into the house today. Father God, we come before you today. We just thank you for yet another day, another opportunity to return to you all the glory, the honor, and the praise. Fill this place, Holy Spirit. We just thank you. And your word says where two or three are gathered in your name that you are present. If there is a soul that is struggling today, Father God, we ask that you fill that void that you provide peace, that you provide comfort. To our members that are in isolation and quarantine, Father God, we proclaim that victory. We ask for your healing. We ask for your restoration. Father God, we just thank you for continuing to be a blessing, for continuing to bestow upon us the knowledge, the wisdom, the strength to continue to serve, Father God. We continue to bring forth Chaplain Black, our praise and worship team, our whole chapel team, Father God, that you continue to arm them with the strength, the wisdom, Father God, to continue to return to you all the glory as they guide us through the service today. Our wing leadership group and squadron, we ask that you continue to be with them and provide the spirit of discernment to make the necessary decisions and guidance so that they can lead us. More of you, less of us. We thank you, Father God. We love you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, we all pray. Amen. Good afternoon, everybody. I'll be doing your responsive reading today. The text is going to come from Ephesians 1, 3 through 7 and 5, 20. Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. I should make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Amen. Give God a hand clap of praise. He gives us joy. He is our joy even when we're going through it and we can't see it. So please, please give him praise. True. 
now we'll have our announcements by Andy. Andy said about getting a little depressed. Well, I'm going to tell you my story this week. It was a little depression. Uh, me and Miss Jacqueline was at home, TDY, up all night, trying to sleep during the day, still going into the office. But back home, my district association was having their annual session. So guess what? I zoomed in. That uplifted me, and it then kind of made me a little homesick because I'm seeing all my folks. And people were reaching out, hey, where are you? Glad you could zoom in and things like that. So it kind of lifted my spirit a little bit. So I was up late last night doing the same thing. But it's all good. I'm still here. God has blessed us to get out. We're still breathing. And we are awesome. So it's offering time. And we're going to only do online today. Online offering. Okay. So. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7 says, For each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. For the tithe is not a debt that we owe, but a seed that we sow. We give because the Lord has given so much to us. Everything we have belongs to the Lord. So this is just a way to say, Thank you, Lord, for all the blessings for all the doors you have opened up. Even though man closes one door, God still opens another door. So you're wondering why we tithe, what, what the offering is used for. Well, it's for the advancement of the Lord's kingdom. We also purchase Bible study materials. Um, once COVID passes and we get to a new normal, we'll probably be doing some religious retreats. We do food for fellowships and given to select charities. So in, on the back of your bulletin, it shows us, well, is it not on here this month? Normally it would be on here to tell us which um, charity we're donating to. So we want the gospel service to be known for our generosity and what we're doing for Insulic Air Base and all those other charities that we um, donate to. So let's prepare our hearts for giving let us bow our heads in a word of prayer, please. Father God, we come before you this afternoon just to give you thanks. We thank you for your wonderful gift of Jesus Christ. Had it not been for him, we would not be here today. We thank you, O oh God, for waking us up. 
We're clothed in our right minds. We have the activities of all our limbs. We just thank and praise you for this opportunity, for this wonderful day to come out and worship and serve you, O oh God. We thank you. We praise you. We ask that you bless this offering, those that are given online. We thank you. Prick their hearts, O oh God, that they will be willing vessels to give back just a small portion of what you asked for. You asked for 10%. Lord, some of us can't do 10%. We ask that you open our hearts and our minds that each and every Sunday that we can give just a little bit more. All these blessings we ask in thy son Jesus' name. Amen. Show. 
I am uh, preaching uh, what you call expositionally, which means we expose what the, what the Word of God says verse by verse. And so what's beautiful about that is that it minimizes any kind of agenda because you're simply going to say what is next in the text. What does God's Word say next? As you go verse by verse and book by book, you're just simply with what's, whatever falls next is what you're going to talk about. Makes it kind of easy, especially if you're uh, used to preaching by topic or speaking by topic, because you're always thinking, what, what am I going to talk about? What am I going to talk about? But this makes it easy. You just say, well, what's next in the text? And so we've been going through in the 1700 service, 1 Samuel. And so we, this morning or this afternoon, we arrive at 1 Samuel chapter 2, looking at verses 22 to 26. 1 Samuel 2, verses 22 to 26. So by way of background, God has answered the prayer of Hannah. Hannah has given birth to Samuel. She had said, Lord, I will dedicate this child to the temple, to service for, for all of his life. The Lord gave that answer. And sure enough, she kept her word. She brought Samuel, and Samuel became a part of temple service in the Old Testament in Israel there, in Shiloh. Eli is the high priest of the Levitical priest system. And Eli has two sons who are also serving. But there's a problem. The problem is Eli and his two sons who are actually running the temple. And so in this chapter 2 and 3, you see a back and forth between, it's almost like when you watch uh, one of your favorite TV shows, maybe um, you watch a show where, you know, it goes from scene to scene, like it'll focus on one group of people for 10 minutes, you know, and then all of a sudden it'll turn and focus on another group of people, you know, and it'll go back and forth like this. You're following people's lives as it develops. That's what's happening here. God focuses on Eli and his sons for a little while, then he switches to Hannah, then he switches to Samuel, and then now back to Back to, to Eli and his sons. That's what's happening in this passage. God is showing us something. He's making a contrast between the two. I entitled this sermon, Stop the Spread, Don't Just Slow the Spread. I figured that was good because of what we're going through right now. And this is a sobering passage. Stop the spread, and if you don't, God will bring dread. And so look with me, we'll read it. Verse 22, Now Eli was very old, and he heard everything his sons did to all Israel, and how they lay with the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. So he said to them, Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all the people. No, my sons! For it is not a good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people transgress. If one man sins against another, God will judge him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? Nevertheless, they did not heed the voice of their father because the Lord desired to kill them. And the child Samuel grew in stature and in the favor both with the Lord and with men. So, these men, these sons, their names are Hophni and Phinehas, and we, there's more to be said about them in the rest of the chapter and in the chapter 3. But these sons as you can see, were spreading their sinfulness, their wickedness, their lawlessness. And what made it not only bad in of itself, but peculiarly terrible, was that they were the priests of the tabernacle, and they were spreading this sin. And so you could see that they had gained a terrible reputation. So the people were making a report the people were reporting, and that's why he says, I ha heard from the people all that you're doing, my sons. No, this is not a good thing. Stop what you're doing. And this lawlessness was spreading. And what we see here in part is the principle of reaping and sowing. Galatians chapter 6 tells us, God will not be mocked. 
whatever a person sows, that will he also reap. And we see here in this passage, Eli's sons have been sowing and sowing and sowing sinful behavior, wickedness. They're involved in temple prostitution. They're involved in greed. They're involved in, uh, earlier in the chapter, in verses 16 and 17, you can see that they are um, not following God's law about how to, to take and receive and give sacrifices in the temple. They're doing all this. They are spreading their sin, and they're not stopping. But God is going to stop them in due time. So the people make this report. Their father, the top priest, hears it. And so now we see after the report is given, we see a rebuke. We see the father's rebuke. Why do you do such things? For I hear all of your evil dealings from all the people. And you'll notice that he says that they were, they were um, in verse uh, 22, it talks about how they were sinning uh, in, in all the ways that are mentioned there. And he says he, he-, he hears everything that they are doing to all of Israel. And whenever we do sin, we are sinning toward someone else as well as to God. And so this report comes, and you know the Scriptures tell us so many places, giving us so many warnings, and that's the point too. God doesn't just uh, have a trigger, trigger finger and go, oops, I'm going to go ahead and take them out of this world as if, as if he's not calibrating, as if he doesn't know what he's doing. Because these men had multiple chances, multiple opportunities, multiple warnings. I think we can comfortably say they were warned for many years, but they continued. In fact, in chapter 2, verse 16 above, we even have an example of where some Israelites came to make their sacrifice, and they tried to correct Hophni and Phinehas in verse 16 because they were, they were seeing how they were misusing God's law to their own advantage for greed. So all of Israel knew what these men were doing. The word was out everywhere. They had a very terrible, dishonoring reputation. And no doubt that it has discouraged the Israelites. Why bother coming to make your sacrifice if these crooked men stand between me and God giving a covering or an atonement for my sins and the sins of my family? So I'm sure it brought great discouragement. But apparently it reaches an apex. It reaches a point so high to where... Eli is hearing all of this, their father, and he steps in to rebuke them. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 13 says, he who despises the word will be destroyed, but he who fears the commandment will be rewarded. Unfortunately, these men do not fear the commandment of God. And so the first part of that verse, Proverbs 13, 13 He who despises the word will be destroyed. That is what is coming their way. And so the father makes a rebuke, and they do not heed their father's rebuke. And that brings us up to the issue of parenting, or perhaps you had grandparents, others in your life growing up, and for those of you who are parents right now, and your family is back home, It is so important for us to be ready to rebuke our children, to be able to say to them, no, you cannot do that. You should not do that. I will not allow that. It's so important for children to learn the boundaries that God has set in his word, isn't it? Because if they don't, if parents don't take this responsibility, if parents don't do as God has called them to do, and praise God, the word word of God, the Bible's full of how to do it. So we we as parents are not left in the dark as, oh, what do I do? How do I do this? The world is telling us how we should do things. But as followers of Christ, we want to follow his word, and his word tells us how to be parents. And so you can see, obviously, that these young men were rejecting the rebuke of their father, and we don't have time for it today, but indeed, if you study Eli closer, you'll find out he was not a very good father all along. And this is almost like too little, too late. But in any case, it's a good reminder to us as parents or guardians 
teaching our children, right? Train up in the child in the way he should go, right? Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6 and 7 tells us we should have our children exposed to the word of God when they rise up, when you walk along the way, when you lie down at night, when you sit together. In other words, that verse is saying comprehensively their life should be filled with the things of the Lord and with his word because that's your opportunity before they hit whatever, 18 or something and they might out the door and they start their own life. You have a short time. Think about that. You know, most, let's, say, let's say someone lives to the average of 80 or 85. Of all that time, you have only just those beginning years to do all you can. Not that you won't help them through life later, but those formative years, the years they're under your authority, the years in which they respect you, the years in which they can have a healthy fear of you as parents and listen to you, the years in which you're in control of their schedule and you can determine the priorities of their life. Those are the years to invest in them. These young men, obviously, were in such open, callous rebellion. The report of the people did not work for them to, 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 to tamp them down some. The rebuke of their father did not work. They had years of chances to change their ways. They did not. Their father rebukes them. They do not change their ways. And that's why we see the sons continue in their rebellion. And as Proverbs 29, 1 tells us, there's, you know, people have different reactions because it has to do with who, what their, what their, um, who their God, who their Lord is, who they want to follow. But Proverbs 29, 1 he who is often rebukes and hardens his neck will suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. These men were often rebuked, but they hardened their neck. And we won't get to it textually today, but I encourage you to read on through the week. You will find that they will suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. They will live, Proverbs 29, 1, out in their life. And it's a good warning for us to remember that God will not be mocked. Whatever we sow, there will be a reaping. And so they rebel. And so you can see all along the way, and notice in verse 24, you make the Lord's people transgress. The Bible talks about what's called stumbling blocks. Don't be a stumbling block. Of course, the, the, the picture is you're walking along the path and someone puts some blocks or a log right out in front of you and you stumble and you fall. And that's used metaphorically to describe someone that fall is a fall into sin. That fall is a fall into something that is ungodly. Or perhaps you, are, you have misled someone into something that is bad. And so you can see the weight of their guilt is compounded by the fact that not only are they personally sinning for their own selfish reasons of greed, they're, 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 they're whoring right in the temple with the women outside the door, but they are making the Lord's people. Notice it doesn't say making Israel. It says making the Lord's people to transgress. You can hear that sound of possession. This is not just any people, this is God's people. This is God's temple. This is God's system. These are God's sacrifices and offerings. These are God's covenant people of that time, the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. And you are causing them to transgress. Oh, the weight. You know, and in our own lives. Sometimes we think that we can sin in isolation that we can sin in quarantine. No, my friend, there is no such thing as sin in quarantine. There is no such thing as sin in isolation. Even the things that we do that, we don't, that no one else is around, it does affect others because it affects us and we carry that with us. I can be angry at work about something. Here are my bosses are in the room. Licensed, don't I? No, I'm not, I'm not talking about anything with them particularly. You know, for any of us, right? We can be upset or angry at something at work, but 
oftentimes when we come home, what's still riding with us? That anger. And so, or, or some, if I do something that's, that's wrong some place, I bring it with me. And all of a sudden, you find yourself snapping at your children, being impatient with your spouse, being rough with your family. And they're like, what's wrong? We didn't do anything. And you're like, it's because of what happened earlier. Or it's because of some guilt I'm carrying for something I've done that I am passing it on. And so our sin will affect other people, and their sins were causing the Lord's people to transgress because they were the mediators between God and the people. They were the priests. They were the go-betweens. If you want to get to God and get His covering, get His atonement there in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, if you want that, you bring your sacrifice, your animal, to the temple, and you hand it over to the Levitical priests who then, in your place and on your behalf, make that sacrifice to God for you. And you walk away saying, I'm clear with the Lord because I made my sacrifice, but I didn't make it. Really, the priests intermediated for me. But the very men who should be doing that are the ones that are corrupted. No wonder God has the reaction He does. And so God indeed makes a response. And I think verse 25 is so fascinating. Please look at it with me. If one man sins against another, God will judge him. In other words, if two people horizontally, if we offend each other or say something wrong or mistreat each other, we can reconcile that by confession and forgiveness and honesty and so forth. But the verse is saying, but when the sin is directly against God himself, who's going to stand between you and him to reconcile that? Well, there's no one. There's no one. That's the point of the verse. And, and, and he is saying, Eli is saying to his sons, your, your sins are not just horizontal out toward people. You are in a, the position of sacred trust. You are the priests who stand between the people and me, God is saying, and you are sinning directly against me. So tell me, who's going to step in between us to mediate this? And, and that's the point, that's the rhetorical point of verse 25. He's saying, sons, no one's going to be able to help you through this because you're sinning directly against God. And then we see the sons double down in their rebellion. As verse 25 goes on to say, nevertheless, they've heard the rebuke. And they did not take that opportunity to change. Nevertheless, they did not heed the voice of their father. And then we have this very, perhaps to you, surprising, perhaps to you, sobering little phrase. Because the Lord desired to kill them. Some people might think, well, that, that doesn't sound like the God I know. Well, then your argument is with the verses you're looking at and God, because that's his word. God has the right to give life. God has the right to take life. He is the creator. He has that priority. Remember what Job said when Job in chapter 1, when all of Satan brought all that destruction on him? He said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. All right? The Lord is the judge. Think about it. The Lord is everything. He is the judge. He is the lawmaker. And he is the law enforcement. He's all of it. And in this case, he's doing that very thing. He has decided to take these men out of the world right away. Oh, how true it is. God will not be mocked. Whatever a person sows, that will they also reap. And so God desires to take them out, and that is his response. And that should sober us and remind us that if we're going to persist in lawlessness, and I use the word lawlessness because they're breaking God's law, and the Bible says in 1 John 5, 4, sin is lawlessness. That's the actual definition. Sin is lawlessness. 
1 John 5, 4. And so as they break God's law, knowingly and persistently, God makes the decision to take them out of the world. You know, the Scriptures tell us in the New Testament, some people's sins are evident in this life, but they will pay for them later. The Scripture also says some people's sins, even though they might not be evident, will pay for them now. And so the Lord reminds us in His Word, the wages of sin, Romans 3.23, is death. We've got to go back and remember Adam and Eve. In the day that you eat of this tree that's forbidden to you, you will surely die. And so we realize there's a spiritual death and there's a physical death. And this is why those who are outside of Christ... They are born once but die twice, whereas Christians are born twice but only die once. In other words, the unbeliever is someone who, though born into this world, they have a spiritual death and a physical death coming their way. Well, they're, they're in a state of spiritual death and physical death's coming. But for a Christian born into this world as a human being, when Christ saves them, they now are given a new birth. They're born again, reborn and they will only face one death, which is a physical death, because spiritually now they're alive. It's up to God when physical death is going to happen. Spiritual death is already upon us. We all know John 3.16. Do we know John 3.18? But those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed. They've refused to believe in the Son of God already under condemnation, already spiritually dead, already judged. So that means that all of the life we have, all the life of an unbeliever lives are days of mercy and days of opportunity to take that condemnation and turn it around to being forgiven and pardoned and saved. And no longer, as Romans 5.1 or 8.1 tells us, no longer under condemnation. But these men, went, they, they ran through several, several stop signs. They broke through several barriers. They kept going headlong at full speed, being warned over and over again by the people, being warned by their father, knowing the law itself, after all, they're priests, refusing at every turn. And God in his sovereignty said, I have now decided that in this case, I will take these two men out. Sometimes we might say, well, why does he do that to everyone? That's up to God. That's up to God. But we should be thankful that we have the opportunity to turn to him, the opportunity to repent. And these men had so many opportunities, but they said, no, we will do what we want against God and in his face. And in this occasion, God said, I'm going to take them out early. But then as I said at the beginning, there is this back and forth where we go from one life into another. And you'll notice that after verses 22 to 25, we get this sudden scene change. Please look at it there. You know, think about it. Look at this. The last of 25. Because the Lord desired to kill them, period. New sentence. And the child Samuel grew in stature and in favor both with the Lord and men. I mean, there was no commercial between there or anything. It was like a switch. And that's what God is doing. He's showing the contrast between a person who is receiving the favor of God versus someone who is refusing the mercy and warnings of God. And the destinies of both go completely different. And so we see the balance of God. I was talking with someone the other day, and they said, God is love. And, and that's, that was it. That was, that was pretty much, that was it. That was his definition. No, no more to add to that. And yet we see here that God is love, because we see it in verse 26. But we see that God is also a God of justice, a God of truth and righteousness. He's a God of mercy, but he's also a God that will not be mocked. And we see the balance of God here. We see all of him in this sense, both sides. The same God who has the right to bring judgment upon those who rebel in his face is the same God who turns around and grants favor and does good. 
and that's where hope is found. If you have an imbalanced view of God, it's going to affect your life. Some people have a balance of God being all judgment, and they have a real struggle with the mercy and the grace of God. Some, are, God is all love, and they don't see that God is to be and will be respected and honored one way or the other, either in this life or in the life to come. He will be. But here we see the balance of both. So, maybe you know what it's like to kind of identify with some of this. I'm not saying that you've actually done the things that Hophni and Phineas have done, but we can look at our life and say, yeah, I, I know there have been times where I kept doing something that I knew was wrong, and even people knew it too, and even said something to me perhaps. Perhaps you're in that situation now where something is going on in your life that you're doing things you know are not right. Take heed to this passage. God does not owe you anything. You cannot say, you owe me tomorrow, you owe me next week. I'm going to keep doing this until I'm done, until I'm satisfied. That's like walking on a tightrope in the wind. It's not up to you. Just a little more gust of wind and over you go, and that is God's, that is God's determination. And so it, it, it's, it is good for us to, to read this passage, and of course that's why God put it in His Word. He put it there to show us about who He is. He is not to be mocked, but He's also favorable as He is to little Samuel, who's been dedicated to the temple. And Samuel, of course, is going to go on to do awesome and great things for God and for Israel in the future. But that brings us to today with this. There's that haunting question, because there's only one important question here in verse 25. If a person sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? We have the answer to that, don't we? His name is Jesus. 1 Timothy 2.5, for there is one God and there is one mediator between me and him, between God and man, and it's the man Christ Jesus. Praise God that we can answer that question. We can look at verse 25 and say, I know where my redemption is. It's in Jesus. I know that I have a mediator. I know there's someone who is interceding for me. His name is Jesus Christ, died and risen from the dead on the cross, paying for sins like mine. I have someone that stands between me and God, someone that will never fail me and will never fail God and will never fail anyone like any human priest of the Old Testament could ever do. With God having Jesus given to us, we don't have to say, well, I wonder if Jesus is going to get it right. I wonder if Jesus has integrity. I wonder if he's fooling me or not or misleading me. We know the answer is never. We can trust completely in the successful work of Jesus Christ to intercede for us. He is our mediator. He is our intercessor. And this is why I think one of the most beautiful passages in Scripture I'll end with is 1 Peter 3.18 that tells us about, kind of gives a little more of a picture of what the, the, of what Jesus does in this intercessory, kind of using this intercessory kind of language, right? It says, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the just, that's him, for the unjust, that's us, that he might bring us to God. And you can hear it. He suffered and he died once. He was just, we were unjust. Why did he do that? That he might bring us to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Reference to his crucifixion and his resurrection. Who will intercede for us? Jesus Christ will intercede for us. Who can and who will? Christ has. Because he's the one that can bring us directly to God. Praise be to God's name. And so, here we are in this season of slow the spread, and uh, I know Eli, very burdened as a father, probably very embarrassed as well, hears these reports of his own son in the temple, 
And he's like, my sons, I hear this terrible report. No, don't do this. And what he's really saying is, stop the spread of your sin and lawlessness, but they won't. And that's where God steps in and says, I have decided I will not be mocked. They, are, they continually sow, and now they're going to reap. And for us today, we're still capable of doing those very things. And that's why it is an urgent call for all of us and those that we have in our life that we know we need to talk to. We need to say, the spread of sin can be stopped because Jesus can liberate you and free you from that sin. Jesus can forgive you and pardon you and give you new life. And you don't have to do that anymore because greater will he be that is in you than he that is in this world. And God, through Christ, will actually change your life. Be encouraged by that, and don't forget the power of Jesus Christ. Let's turn to Him. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, we are so grateful to see a complete picture of You here in this passage. Lord, You wanted us to see how serious You are about not being mocked. You also wanted us to see the seriousness of sin and what it does to ourselves and other people. You also wanted us to see, Lord, that you have the right to judge, and you do, and you will. And Lord, that should put a holy fear in us and cause us to run, not walk, but run to Christ, to find that one perfect, unfailing mediator, Christ who is called the High Priest. Christ who will intercede and bring your favor upon us to forgive us through his death, burial, and resurrection, and gives us the power of the Spirit to break free from sins that bring us down. Oh, Father God, I pray we would turn to Christ. Thank you, Lord, for your love expressed through Jesus. We know for you love the world so much that you gave your only Son, and we are so grateful for that. Help us, Lord, to walk in the victory that you provide in Jesus. And we ask this all in his name. Amen. Amen. Do we have a closing song or just a benediction? Just a benediction, okay. Well, let's stand to our feet, please. And one of my favorite benedictions I like to give is from the end of Hebrews. It's so encouraging. So it says here in in Hebrews 13, 20, Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of an everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do His will, working in us that which is well-pleasing in His sight. To Him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Hey, God bless you all. We are dismissed. Praise God.